The fog of war might have taken a couple years hiatus. But now it's back, Canes fans. Fasten your seatbelts. Tomorrow is the real National Signing Day. And it's coming back old school style. The drama begins with a defensive end from Miami Pace named Shamar Stewart. Mario Cristobal hires a defensive coordinator the night before signing day. Was that a response to Shamar Stewart saying that he didn't want to sign with Miami without knowing who the defensive coordinator might be? Long thought to be a lock for Texas A&M. Does the hiring of Kevin Steele become a game changer for Miami in the Shamar Stewart sweepstakes? The Canes have surged into the battle in the seven weeks since Mario Cristobal has taken over. Who's going to win tomorrow at 1 p.m. when Stewart makes his announcement at Miami Pace High School and then signs a letter of intent? As we begin this new edition of Kane Sport Live tonight, that one is probably too close to call. And then there's plenty of more drama to be had tomorrow beyond Shamar Stewart. Trevante Citizen, the running back from Louisiana. Dave Iuli, offensive lineman from Washington. Two guys that are on the fence tonight as we begin Kane Sport Live. The defensive line tandem at Cardinal Gibbons High School, Ahmad Moten and, and um, R. Mason Thomas, what are they going to do? We've got some clues. We're going to talk about that here in a moment. So we've got that, all the drama of recruiting, the hiring of Kevin Steele, so much to talk about as we begin this new edition of Kane Sport Live. Hello again, everybody. It's been a while, but I'm Gary Furman, the publisher of Canesport.com, and I welcome you back to Kane Sport Live. Recruiting Edition Part 2. This is your show, and as always, it'll be driven by your participation. The call-in number, 563-999-3550, 563-999-3550. You hit the number one on your keypad if you would like to come on the show. We um, asked the subscribers at canesport.com to submit questions and topics that they would like to hear discussed on tonight's show and we will get to those as we go through the evening. But right now, uh, let me begin with just a capsule look on the guys that have been being recruited here in the second half of recruiting since Mario Cristobal took over as coach, and they finished the first half of recruiting with the early signing day. Um, I'll begin on offense with that running back, Trevante Citizen from Louisiana. And uh, last night, I think I would have said that it was a pretty hopeless situation for Miami. Uh, you know, we felt that he was leaning towards going with Auburn. Uh, we had been hearing that LSU was out of it. Uh, we don't believe Florida was ever seriously really in it. So, you know, we're thinking that Trevante Citizen is probably going to go to Auburn. Well, you know, one thing that you're going to learn with Mario Cristobal is he does never give up. He is a relentless recruiter. And about midday today, I started to hear some rumbles that Miami had been making some progress with Citizen. And where yesterday, if I was going to make a percentage, I would have said 25%. By midday today, I probably would have been at 55%. Um, as day turned into night, I started to hear a little differently. And uh, you know, the funny thing is, is there was a lot of conjecture that LSU was out of it. But the truth of the matter is, for a kid in Louisiana, doesn't LSU always figure to be in it, no matter what anybody says? Uh, it's like if you're recruiting a kid from South Florida, you'd like to think that at least under this new regime of Miami football, as it gets its feet planted under it now, that Miami's always going to be in, in the mix for South Florida kids. And uh, I think that's the case with Trevante Citizen in LSU. And uh, so now, if I had to make a prediction right now as we begin this show, um, I've heard a lot of LSU rumblings the last hour or two. And uh, I'm now expecting Citizen to go to LSU over Auburn with Miami finishing a close second 
possibly third. Uh, we'll see how that, how that plays out here between now and tomorrow morning. Um, all right, um, obviously, um, with Alex Mirball and Mario Cristobal in the case, offensive line has gotten a big focus, and Miami's having some mixed results here. But, um, it, it's, it's, it's not all good. It's not all bad. Um, let's start with the good, and uh, Anis Cooper – from Alabama, a real athletic big guy who kind of came on the scene late because he needed to shed some weight, and he's done a decent job of doing that. But this is a big human being, um, a guy that realistically could play defensive tackle or offensive line. Uh, we think he's going to settle on the offensive line, uh, probably as as a guard, I would I would think. And um, we expect him to sign with Miami today. Also, another one that we expect to sign with Miami today is Matthew McCoy from St. John's Creekside. Uh, visited Florida officially last weekend. It looked like the Gators might have made some headway. Um, but then Miami closed strong here. And uh, barring a major upset, we think Matthew McCoy will be signing with Miami today as well. I mean, tomorrow as well. Um now I'll get to, to the guy that's kind of going so-so, and that's the five-star offensive tackle from Seattle, Josh Connerly. Um, Great-looking prospect. Uh, Mario Cristobal's obviously been recruiting him for a long time. He visited Miami officially last weekend. It went very, very well, except for one thing. He's saying he's not going to sign today or tomorrow. I'm getting, my day, I'm getting my days all mixed up. I'm sorry. He's saying he's not going to sign tomorrow, uh, that he's going to wait a few weeks, that he still wants to visit USC. He still wants to visit Oregon. And to me, based on my experience, that is a little bit of a problem for Miami, simply because he is on the opposite end of the country. They have already had their visits with him. And you have these schools out there that are going to get to make the final case for themselves. And, uh, that's going to be a tough one to close here. I, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. You know, obviously, it's an important one for uh, Cristobal and Mirabal, and they're going to be all over it. You you don't have to worry about that. Uh, it just seems to me like it's it's going to be tough to hold on to the lead with a kid that's on the entire opposite side of the country. So that one will be interesting to watch here in the coming days and weeks, unless they can convince him to not go down that road and to sign with the Hurricanes. Um, and then the other one that is sitting on the fence is Dave Iuli. I mean, a week ago, he was all about Miami. I mean, everybody thought he was coming to Miami. His parents thought he was coming to Miami. Something changed. I mean, he visited Oregon this past weekend. Uh, you know, maybe it was NIL. You know, maybe they just did a good job recruiting him. I, you know, don't have the answers for you on this one. But now Dave Iuli is expected to sign with Oregon tomorrow. So we'll see what happens there. I think that's another one that Miami will fight right down to the finish. Um, if it flipped the, uh, in Miami's direction, it would not surprise us in the least. Um, but right now it looks like Iuli is going to go to Oregon. Okay, the other battles have been on the defensive line. I, I talked about Shamar Stewart quite a bit in the open. Um, that one seemed like it was drifting away from the Hurricanes today. Um, obviously disappointing. They've, they've, they've put so much into it. Um, but the fact that Miami didn't have its defensive coordinator in place, um, was getting in the way a little bit. And quite frankly, Texas A&M has been the leader for several months now. So I, I think to say that the fact that it took a while to get a defensive coordinator cost Miami Shamar Stewart, if that's the way it plays out is a reach. I don't know that that would be quite accurate, but, um, you know, as we sit here tonight doing this show, my guess is that the rest of this evening, Kevin Steele is going to be on the Shamar Stewart case and is going to be trying to convince Shamar Stewart either to sign with Miami or give it another day or two and come meet Kevin Steele on campus. Um, I believe, uh, and all these rules kind of get tangled with each other, but I, I, I I, I believe that Shamar would be allowed to unofficial to Miami. Um, um, I hope I'm not wrong on that. I believe that that's what the rule states uh, beginning because um, I, I know they can't visit him, but at, at worst they could talk on the phone and things like that. So I'm going to have to look into exactly what the rule is in the next few days. Um, I know it's a dead, it's a, it's a technically a dead period or, you know, for, 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 uh, 
a certain amount of time, but um, I have not paid much attention to that because it was signing day. So I apologize for that. I'll have to do some research into that. But the point is that Kevin Steele needs to now try to close Shamar Stewart. He's the guy, the only guy that could do it. And there's not a pre-existing relationship there. Um, we spoke to Shamar Stewart's advisor earlier this evening who has never met Kevin Steele, doesn't know Kevin Steele from Kevin Adams, you know, and that's not good either. So we'll see what happens there. If you want to stress about this one, you got a lot of reason to stress. Uh, we'll see what happens here in the closing hours of recruiting on Shamar Stewart. Um, in Christian Miller, I mean, he's going to Georgia. It was a nice shot this past weekend when he visited. They took their, they, they, you know, they made their best case. They did a good job. Uh, but he's going to Georgia. And that leaves us with the duo at Cardinal Gibbons High School in Fort Lauderdale, Ahmad Moten and R. Mason Thomas. And um, at one point, we thought they both might go to Miami. I mean, it was trending in that direction. But it's now looking like that is not going to be the case. And the best case scenario for, for Miami is that they get one of them. Uh, as we sit here tonight, the best information that I've been getting in the last couple hours is that Miami will get Ahmad Moten, and they will not get R. Mason Thomas, who so will go to either Iowa State or Oklahoma, and Oklahoma thinks that they have a great shot there. So um, that brings you up to speed on what's going on with all this recruiting. Uh, you've got Kevin Steele coming as defensive coordinator. So much for us suddenly to talk about here on Kane Sport Live. We've been pining for a show for weeks. Now we got it. It's here and a lot on the table, uh, including the coaching searches that have been going on, the, the um, I'm not going to say struggle, but the process of trying to find the right coordinators, how it ended up in Kevin Steele's lap on defense, what's going to happen on offense. Um, so a lot on our plate for tonight as we go into Kane Sport Live. So let's get right to your calls. The number 563-999-3550, 563 999-3550. You hit the one on your keypad if you want to come on the show. And I'm also going to bring in um, our my Kane Sports sidekick, Matt Shodell, who I believe is is with us now, who can help me answer some of your questions. Matt, you there? I'm here. All right. Um, a lot hey, of you guys. Thanks for letting me actually be on the show. With I've hey man, like for years you, you got a lot of your fan club. They've they've been they've been begging for some Shodell on Kane Sport oh my Live. God, my, my, my mom's on yeah. here. Hey, mom. <laughs> I mean, they, they 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 don't understand that you know we all can't do everything all the time. You know, we got we got to have lives. We got to do different things at different times. But um, anyway, um, Matt's going to be with us for a little bit to help me answer some of your questions on some of the recruits and stuff. Um, so we'll, we'll see what direction that goes in. And uh, let's start out in the nine one seven tonight, where you are live on Kane Sport Live. How you doing? Yeah, what's up, BK Hurricane? What's up, BK? How you been, man? Hope, hope well and, and safe and all those things. Yeah, I've been pretty good. Just hanging in there. Listen, um, um, I'm sorry, man. Um, how have you been? I hope everybody's all right. Family's all right. You too, Matt. Uh, listen, uh, why hasn't there been that much movement with the linebacker situation? You know, either in a transfer portal or you know, uh, you know, in in recruiting, like. It's almost like it's a forgotten position. After we got Wesley Bassaint, it was like, okay, we're done. That's the impression. <laughs> but Matt, it, but it's it, it, arguably one of our weakest points. Yeah, uh, no it's argument. Um, you know, Matt. Uh, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll let you take that one. I mean, I, my opinion would be there just haven't been a lot of good linebackers available to recruit. Well, there's also <laughs> it doesn't help. It's, it doesn't help there's no linebackers coach, right? <laughs> I mean, because a linebackers coach a lot of times will, or a defense coordinator for that matter, will say this is the type of guy we need in our system. For instance, Kevin Steele, he wants to use a strong side linebacker, not the hybrid type Miami's been using, and they don't really have a guy like that on the roster right now. I'm sure they would have wanted to get somebody and sold them on, hey, you can come in and be a difference maker, whether it's from the portal or not. So that there will be some movement, I, I, my guess, is this summer in the portal if they don't see guys on the field this spring that they think can help them? Well, let's hope there's a guy. <laughs> Our linebackers <laughs> are a ton of light. 
to kind of yeah. like well, Chase Smith, <laughs> you know Chase Smith can be if Chase Smith gains some weight, he's going to be really, really good. Corey Flagg's okay in the middle; he's not bad. Cantor Smith's okay uh, at the weak side, so, and the Saints will come in and be and be a guy who could, if he puts on some weight, who could push the start or at least be in that rotation. So it's not the end of the world, especially if they can get a, a pretty good transfer potentially who can come in and start. I I really think that'll happen this summer, and, and there's this should be a high high quality guy that can get in the portal because. <clears throat> there is that chance to play right away at, at a Miami, um, you know, in this new system. I, I think that'll be very attractive to people. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing, BK. I, Chase Smith, to me, is a huge key. Huge. He he has got to develop into a big-time player between now and September. Well, let's, let's hope so. Um, so, Gary, in regards to the – this is the hot button topic, Gary, in regards to the OC candidates, right? Mm-hmm. I know that it came down to, okay, it may be Ponce, but it may or it may not be. But um, what do you think was the, you know, why there was so little, um, not so little, why were there was such a slow going in finding a good OC? Or is it just that Manny wasn't sure as to what type of system he wanted to run. Mar- because Ma- I always Ma- wondered why they Mario, don't 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 Marvel. don't call him Manny. Definitely don't call him Manny. I mean Mario. Oh my God. See? Yeah, yeah, it's Mario. It's in green. It's, it's, it's in green. <laughs> Gary. It's in green. Hey, here's here's what I think happened. BK. BK. Um, I think it started out where Rob Chudzinski is Mario's guy. Okay, Rob yeah. Chudzinski is one of the most experienced offensive coaches in the country. Uh, he he was an NFL coordinator for 15, 20 years. He was a national championship coordinator at Miami. Um, you know, back in 2001, he rose to be a head coach in the NFL, even though it wasn't really his cup of tea and it didn't go well. Uh, but very experienced offensive coach. He's Mario's guy. They're very close friends. I think in, in his ideal world, it was lure Rob Chudzinski back to Miami. Well, you know, Chud's kind of been there, done that. He's tired, you know. He, you know, he he lived the grind for 20 years, um, missed a lot of his kids growing up, things like that, if for the sake of his job. And you know, right now he's into being a family guy and a dad, and he's he's a consultant at Boston College, and he's got plenty of money. He'll never spend all the money he has from all the years in coaching and making those big, you know, million dollar salaries and stuff. So uh, he just doesn't want to do that, and. So so it started out, I think, like that, okay? Then I think it went to Ken Dorsey. And Ken Dorsey, to me, I was never, like, overwhelmed with that idea just because, you know, he, he's got some good experience as a quarterback's coach. He's clearly on the right career path. He'd never called a play in his life. And, you know, somebody's going to say, oh, yeah, well, yeah, you think Dorsey's not good enough to be the OC at Miami, but the Buffalo Bills just made him their offensive coordinators and OC in the NFL. I get it, okay? So was Joe Brady, okay? And look how quickly Joe Brady flamed out in, in Carolina after one good year at LSU. He was not ready for that, okay? Uh, he had one decent year, not even as the main coordinator at LSU, and they had an offense around that was built around a bunch of first-round draft picks that, to me, skewed – the, the, the sample of work and, uh, you know, so many coaches make so many mistakes when hiring, when hiring coaches and, and filling out their staffs. And um, so I think had Ken Dorsey wanted to come to Miami and be the offensive coordinator, that there would have been a lot of excitement in, in the fan base. But I'm not overly bothered by that at all, to be honest with you, like just because yeah. I think it would have been a gamble. I mean, it would have been a, a gamble. That you know, you know, Ken Dorsey's never worked with with college players he, as a coach, you know, like that. He's he, he's never had called a play and had to manage a game from an offensive standpoint. Uh, so I personally was not real bothered by that, but I believe that's where Mario went when Chud flamed out. So now he's kind of waiting to see what happens with Dorsey. Dorsey was still going through his NFL season, and he starts talking to other guys, and his agent also represents the head coach of Toledo, Jason Candle. And there were a lot of conversations for about a month between Mario and Jason Candle about the possibility of Jason Candle becoming the offensive coordinator at Miami. And Candle was kind of okay with the idea. You know, he'd been a head coach at Toledo. Um, 
had ups and downs. Uh, you know, things were getting a little a little shaky there. He was, you know, he wasn't so sure. And I think Jason Candle would have been very interested in this job, except for one thing. I I ran into one of his coaches the other day actually, and uh, got the inside scoop on this that. The reason Jason Candle retreated from becoming the offensive coordinator um, at Miami was 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 that he couldn't get Toledo to hire his replacement from his existing staff, and um, he did not want to leave all those guys out of work. Um, I, I mean, you got to like give the guy a plus for honor being honorable. I mean. You know, hey, like I'm the head coach. I'm already making my million five or whatever they pay at Toledo to be the head coach here. So this isn't about money. I don't want to leave all my guys without a job. And at that point, Miami didn't have openings. I mean, Mario had already hired Kevin Smith. They had BMAC at wide receiver. They had Alex Mirabal on the O-line. They have Steve Field at tight ends. And there were no spots for Jason Candle to bring anybody with him. He opts out. Okay, and Kendall Bryles, I don't think ever was going to get offered the job. That was all a bunch of nonsense, you know, bad reporting. So the combination of all this, BK, I think has left has left things kind of at square one offensively. And now you got the Frank Ponces of the world entering the equation. Right, but was Jeff Longo ever offered? He runs the offense that Mario wants to run. Was who offered? Jeff Longo, um, North Carolina's um, OC. No. He's been killing. Their I don't know where that, came from. I don't know where that come, came from. There's so many bad rumors going around no, these no, days. No, 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 that's coming from me. I'm just asking. You know, oh, okay. that was just me asking. No, he was never that's in the picture here at all. Okay. No. Okay. I thought he would have been pretty decent considering they like to run the ball. <laughs> and... And we're pretty proficient at passing. And and for the last three years, they had one of the better offenses in college football. Yeah. Well, I mean, the bottom line is this this has not been easy. You know, it, it has not gone as smoothly as you would like. And then on top of it, obviously, Mario's been spending 99% of his time on recruiting. Because the fact of the matter is, it doesn't matter who your coordinators are. If you don't have players, it, they're not going to be successful anyway. So. All right, Gary. Thanks a lot, Matt. Thanks a lot. Uh, just keep me on. All right, BK. Thanks sure for being a part of the show as always. 563-999-3550. 563-999-3550. You hit the one on your keypad if you want to come on the show. Let's go out now to the 845. You're live on Kane Sport Live. How are you doing tonight? Yeah, Gary. How you doing? Greg. Hey, what's up, Greg? How you been, man? I'm good. How you How you doing, Matt? I'm doing great. Enjoy, How are you doing, Greg? I enjoy you guys every day. You're pretty funny. But anyway, um, let's talk about Shamar Stewart for a second. Let's get down to the nitty-gritty here. Was he offered an NIL deal by Miami? Miami can't. They can't. Like, like I mean, well, let, let's just say that schools, schools themselves right now can't. And this is going to change. Not by Miami, by John Ruiz. I, I, I'm sure that he knows he, he would get an NIL deal if he, it, once he once he arrives at Miami. I don't I don't think there's any question about that. Just like I'm sure Texas A&M has made it pretty clear to him that if he comes to Texas A&M, he's going to have a very big NIL deal. Shamar Stewart is going to have a big NIL deal no matter where he goes. Okay, is there any possibility? Mario's buddy, James Coley, came in with a bag from Texas A&M. And Mo, the guy Mo, can, he's not going to get any piece of the NIL deal. And his buddy can get a piece of the bag. And he doesn't have to pay taxes. on the he, If you get dropped the bag, it's not taxable. The NIL deal is. Let, let's, let's, if he goes to Texas A&M, that's why, okay? All right. He has all these friends on Miami, doesn't he? Isn't he friends with a lot of players on the team? I would say he's friendly. He's been on campus a million times. Okay. 
one other thing about Shamar Stewart. This weekend, he had a separate recruiting visit than everyone else. On the t- what kind of crap is that? It was He's a, a it prima was a, donna. He's yeah. a prime 112, and everyone else is somewhere else. What kind of teammate is that? Well, I don't want guys like that. On the, I don't care how good he might be. It's a joke. How, how, have you ever heard of anything like this? It was a tactic. Matt, Matt, what do you think? Was it effective? Well, I don't know what you mean by effective. I think what their idea was was to really, instead of having multiple recruits sort of, I don't want to say sharing the spotlight, but getting information from coaches and sort of seeing what they think of the coaches personally, he wanted to get one-on-one time since it's only a weekend. And I had another recruit tell me he wished they could spend five days in Miami. Two days isn't enough. So I, I don't necessarily blame Shamar Stewart. I don't say that it's a selfish thing to do. It is selfish, but the reason is it's his life. These decisions for these kids are their lives. They have three to five years to become an NFL player where they can make real money. Yeah, they can make some NIL money for a little bit of time. But if, you have, if, if, if it was my son and he wasn't sure where he wanted to go and he had two days to really get a sense for a program in Texas and two days to really get a sense for a program in Miami, I know they could have come more often unofficially, but really officials are a little different. I would have said to him also, like, listen, you could be around 10 other kids who are vying for attention from the coaches, but the coaches are offering an opportunity to just have one-on-one time with them and do your own itinerary with them. Why wouldn't you do that, you know? I don't blame Shamar for that. I don't see it as selfish because guess what? Once they're in the program, that's it. I remember in the old days when when kids would show up on campus, they were shocked because the coaches were their best friends during recruiting, and once they sign, they're not best friends anymore. They are now basically owned by the team and by the coaches, and you do what the coaches say or else, and they will yell at you and they will berate you and they will make you work your butt off to be the best you can be. So, yeah, I don't blame Miami coaches for pandering to him. I don't blame him for trying to get to try to figure out what he's doing. But guess what? Once he signs, it, they're not going to be nice to him anymore, and he better be ready for that. So I don't care if he's a prima donna now. He sure as hell won't be when he gets on campus anywhere. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it was, a, ploy. It was, it was a ploy, Greg. It, it was a strategy to try to make him feel special and give him uh, a little bit more of a private audience with the coaches to discuss his future or potential future at Miami. And while they were at it, they took him to the what's universally uh, considered one of the best restaurants in South Florida. So, right. uh, you know, everybody else. That, I guess, restaurant, that, restaurant, by, that restaurant, by the way, is so good that they don't have peanuts or pretzels on the bar counter while you're waiting to be seated. They have strips of bacon. That is the best bacon you've ever had in your life. My my son it really is. the bacon when we went there. He was he was actually sick. <laughs> he couldn't even eat dinner. <laughs> the bacon's unbelievable. It, it is. It's unbelievable. It's it, it's like you're like, where does this bacon come from? I've never had bacon like this in my life. Yeah, it's like crazy. Yeah. Okay, I got one more point about this nil nonsense. Let me ask you, Greg. If Shamar Stewart just say got a, a half a million dollar deal from John Ruiz, okay? And Leonard Taylor ends up being better, which is a good possibility. What's he going to want? Is he going to say, I'm leaving if I don't get 600000 or Well, it'll, it's, it's, no, it, 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 100% it's going to start coming to that. There's no doubt about it, Greg. It's horrible. It's ruining college football. Well, it's a lot all... of people would agree with you. A lot, a, a lot of people agree with you. And you know who agrees with you a lot? Also, is some of the coaches who are now going to have be coaching kids that are making more money in NIL than they get paid. Like, no, no listen, this is a game changer. This is this is going to take a lot of getting used to for to a lot of people. Uh, my last quick point. So, by the looks of it, we're going to end up with the two lowest rated players out of. Ten guys, we're going to get two, maybe three guys. That's a Manny closing. I mean, I can't really blame Mario. He's only been here, what, seven weeks? But, I mean, he's like a bridesmaid. He's second on all these players. That's not going to cut it. Next year, that's not going to cut it. I don't care what anyone says. He's going to have a whole year. All right, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. 
All right, Greg, thanks as always for being part of the show. Matt, uh, your, your, your thoughts on what Greg just said. Uh, you know, is, is, yeah, is, this a, I, is, this, is this a failure for Mario Cristobal, or is this reality coming into a school with, with, with seven, you know, seven weeks to go in recruiting, and you know, you're, you're, you're trying to reach and pull kids that maybe you're recruiting to Oregon, maybe you weren't recruiting at all, and now – you know, now you're trying to piece together the semblances of a great recruiting class. Was, was any of that ever reality, or or, or is this a, is is this a failure for Mario? I mean, you say failure. Re- recruiting is not about winning battles; it's about failing as few times as possible. <laughs> so, True. is he is he going to fail quite a bit? Yeah, but it, it's almost like it's almost like playing a game of baseball, and if you're hitting 300, it's it's pretty good. And if you chase all these top prospects and get 30% of them at the end of the day, you're, you're doing pretty darn well in college football. The, you have to remember also, they really are only recruiting offensive linemen and defensive linemen, which I think is actually sort of brilliant because let's face it, they don't really have a need at running back. They don't have position coaches to really recruit guys at linebacker, DB, I would even argue, DVD, you know, that's not really um, a position. They don't know really who the overall DB coach is going to be on the, on the other side of the ball. You don't have an offensive coordinator. Um, you know, and they did, but they did take Henry Parrish. Um, they yeah. did take no, Frank Glass. Recruiting, recruiting is a little but, bit different. But I'm just saying they, they had already, because, but they fortified those spots too. I mean, they you know, yeah, Frank Glass. Henry, Henry Parrish is it? Henry, Henry Parrish. Parrish. You say Henry Parrish. His his position coach came here, so I mean, it's not like they had to really recruit him from scratch, right? So my point is, these are guys who they reached out to a month and a half ago and said, hey, we want you to come to Miami, and started recruiting them. And, yeah, some of them were recruited to Oregon, but it's a different animal at Miami. So bottom line, they're only recruiting defensive linemen and offensive linemen in reality. And if you get a couple of pretty good defensive linemen at this point, and remember, they did get Cyrus Moss. I would probably include him in this as well. Um, and, and, and the offensive linemen, who they didn't sign any of them in the early period, and you get a you know two or three – decent offensive lineman out of this. I, I'm not sure Dave Uli is dead either. I know, like I said earlier in the day, yes, or earlier in the day today, sorry, he, um, you know, Mario doesn't give up here just because there's some noise that he may wind up going to Oregon. This is this is a battle, and Mario does yeah. not give up on these kids. So nope. that's still in play. So you get uh, Anez Cooper, you get Matthew McCoy, maybe Dave Uli, and then you still have Josh Connolly in the wings later down the road. Like that's not that's not a failure, you know. Not at me. all. That's no, fine. I, I, that's I fine. agree. This is a month and a half. If 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 after recruiting kids for 14 months in the class of 2023, he's striking out on top local guys who he's been recruiting hard for 14 months, it's a problem. But but like you and I have talked about previously, Gary. To me, the biggest issue is Mario Cristobal is a great recruiter. There is you can't debate it. He is. But that is being upstaged by NIL. And now the big question is, can he and the NIL combine to make Miami an Alabama, an Ohio State, a, a whatever program you want to name? Because that's the new thing now. It's not, okay, we have the coach who's a great recruiter. That's not enough anymore. So, yeah, Miami looks like they're getting this NIL deals in place. But until you really see them come to fruition in this 2023 class where kids are all coming here because they know the NIL deals are all going to be here for everybody – that's really when we're going to say, what do they say, the proof's in the pudding? That's, that's when the proof will be in the pudding. I don't even know where that comes from, but I eat a lot of pudding. I've never seen a proof in it. So I'm going to go with that <laughs> thing anyway. I mean, and, and I'm listen, I'm somebody as guilty as anybody on expectations. I mean, you know, my expectations for Mario as a recruiter are always going to be very high. I know how good he is. And, you know, I, as recently as last week, I, I thought that they were going to get the bulk of – I talked about nine guys. I think ten, there were nine, ten guys that they were recruiting. I thought they were going to get six of them, maybe seven. I mean, I really did. Now it looks like they're going to get three, maybe four. But uh, I'm not sure. And you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of smacking myself a little bit. Was I being, was I realistic? You know, I mean, I don't know. I, there's second second thoughts there a little bit. But uh, I think Miami will be fine <laughs> once the program gets uh, gets set up with a full staff of coaches. Once the support staff gets built properly, there's so much work to do. He's not even 50% in to what he's going to end up doing here and have to do. So, um, you know, maybe like those of you that are like me that were maybe more bullish and optimistic than we should have been, um, you know, maybe we just have to accept that maybe we went too far and that what we are seeing play out is more reality. 
All right, 563-999-3550, 563-999-3550. Hit one on your keypad if you want to come on the show. Let's go to 706. You're live on Kane Sport Live. Hey, Gary, it's your boy Sebastian. Man, I didn't know I was going to get called so, so soon. Hey, man. What's up, Sebastian? How you doing tonight? Between, great job. Pretty good. Great job between you and Matt on Good Morning Kane Sport. I tell you, that's kind of just the way to kind of start off my morning. I got a question for Matt, if, if that's okay, uh, while he's on the phone, yeah. and then I'll come back to you. So, 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 Matt, I know you guys, you and Gary, goes back and forth with all the numbers as far as the attrition and everything that needs to kind of take place. I mean, realistically speaking, I mean, how many players do you think we need to still add from the portal, and how many players do you think probably need to, you know, maybe kind of trim the fat just a little bit? So we could have a good uh, 23 recruiting class. Oh, that's a great question. And I'm glad you mentioned numbers because it makes Gary crazy. And anything that makes Gary crazy makes me very, very happy. So thank you for the question. Drives me insane. So so right now – it does make Gary insane. So right now they're at, by my count, 86. Another uh, reporter who covers the Hurricanes that I'm friendly with has them at 85. So we're both in the same ballpark, which I mentioned the other day on on Good Morning Canesport. But, but yeah, I, I do think they add – Gary said three or four. I think they add four or five tomorrow, quite honestly. I'm a little more – I'm usually the negative whatever, but I actually think I'm being a little more positive um, just because I, I do think that they still have a chance with Shamar. I think they get either one of Ahmad or Mason, uh, and I think they get two to three offensive linemen. So that's why I'm coming with that number. So let's say they get – let's just make it uh, around four, and that will put them at um, at 90 on the roster. And then I still think they should add another probably five transfers, and I'll go through the positions in a minute, that I think they should get. But if you add five more in the summer, and that would be in the summer, obviously, you can't enroll anymore for this semester. So now you're talking about, you know, 10 of the current players coming off the roster. And like I said, in the, you know, we did this right up, I don't know, a week or two ago, where we said basically that there has to probably be 18 cut over the next two years. So 10 this year, probably eight next year, something like that. Could be more because they could certainly take more than that, but I think that's a reasonable amount to trim from the roster. And if you look at the roster, I'm not going to point to people that should be trimmed from the roster, but you can find 10. It's not that hard. Um, so what I think they need to add, I, I think, um, you know, Gary – well, okay, I'll talk for myself. I, I think that they need probably one to two more offensive linemen. They need a right tackle desperately. I think they need better depth. The problem with that is it's easy to convince a guy who's a tackle to come in that he can start right away. It's a little harder to convince a guy to come who might be a depth guy. But they definitely need one to two more offensive linemen. I still think they need another defensive lineman only because they, they've taken two transfers, but I don't think either of those guys are difference makers. And, and I think if a guy comes in the portal who's a difference maker in the summer, and there will be guys who are difference makers. Look what happened at FSU last year, right? There will be somebody who went into that portal that Miami says, man, this guy's good. You've got to grab him. The defensive line is not where it needs to be. They've got some decent freshmen, but those guys aren't going to be ready to play on the line and, and be physical up front. At linebacker, I think they need – I would take one to two um, for sure, one to two. They definitely need at least one, <laughs> especially with Kevin Steele because he, he wants to use that strong side linebacker who's athletic and big. And they don't have a guy like that right now, like we said, unless Chase Smith really puts on some weight or somebody like that. And then I honestly would love them to add a cornerback. So, you know, I don't know if they're going to do all of that. I, I think that adds up to something like five to seven guys. But those are the things that I think they need to certainly have an eye on doing. Um, you know, if you have to say one or the other, I'd say like cornerback is maybe the lesser concern just because with Tyreek back, I do like what I saw from Marcus Clark. And I think, you you know, Tory Couch is good at nickel. And they got Al Blades and, 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 um, and DJ Ivy as, as depth, which isn't bad. It's just I don't see that top guy – who's going to be a shutdown corner. Like if you have some, another Tyreek Stevenson, for instance, who's this little faster version of Tyreek, I mean, that would make this defensive back core sick with those safeties. And that would be huge. Um, so anyway, that's my breakdown. Okay. I can't believe I, I actually agree with them, but I don't think they're ever going to stop looking for players. I don't think the roster's close to a championship level. And I don't think they're ever going to stop looking for players. And I don't think, that, that Mario's worried about the, the numbers, even 10% of what Matt Shodell is. And um, I think that there's going to continue to be opportunities in the transfer portal as teams go through spring practice and then exit spring practice. Hey, Gary, this question is for you, man. Do you have any, any – is there anybody that we're not tracking on the radar that could sign with Miami tomorrow? 
Uh, not that we know of. Um, I mean, if they've got a secret recruit out there, it, we certainly haven't heard about them. Okay. Okay. Um, hey, Gary, appreciate the rundown with the offensive coordinator. I mean, it, I'm sure, like, many fans were just kind of wondering, like, what was going on with that. Um, but what I, what I, I want to know really is this, speak, this is this is what I want to know, Sebastian, and, and, you, and you can answer this mm-hmm. on behalf of – the fan base and maybe some other guys will weigh in on this. I want to know what the panic has been. Like, why has there been so much anger and so much discord among the fan base over the timeline of hiring coordinators? Like, what difference does it make? Okay. Like, okay, okay, y- y- I, you know, I, I is it, you the- isn't the bottom line who gets the job and then how they perform in it? Does it really matter what their date of employment is? You know, you, you know, I, I know how easily you could see it that way, but here's what I would say. The thing about the coordinators, too, like from, for me, a fan that communicates to me, is when a coordinator comes in, he brings in the, the opportunity of their additional prospects that may be out there that we're just not tracking. There may be an opportunity that if you bring a coordinator in, maybe from the NFL or if he came from another school, that there may have been some other targets or some other players that he could have been recruiting, number one, or two, they could have transferred over with him. Now, you look at the Lincoln Riley situation over at USC. When Lincoln Riley went over to USC, how many of those players went from Oklahoma to USC? And how many of those recruits that were looking at Oklahoma ended up going to USC? So that's what it communicates to us. I'm not discouraged because, I mean, the pick for Kevin Steele is like an A+. plus. I mean, this is not a learn-on-the-job defensive coordinator. This is a defensive coordinator that's coached defense at the highest level in the SEC who's won championships, who, who really knows how to put a good defense together. And if you look at what Miami has gone through over the last maybe three seasons, we can't really say that. Mm-hmm. So now can we just kind of do that on the offensive end as well? I don't want no somebody that's going to be a fly-by-night. I, don't, I didn't want someone who's going to be a quick hire. But the thing about getting an offensive coordinator early in the process is being able to maybe have other kids you may be recruiting or kids that you play with. I mean, Mirabar brought one of his offensive linemen from Oregon. Why? Because he knew the capabilities of this guy. That's what it was about. Does that answer your question, Gary? Yeah. Yeah, I just, I've just been, like, startled by the intensity of some of the negativity. And, you know, I know some of it yeah. is people trolling. You know, they're fans of other schools pretending to be Miami fans. And, you know, they're trolling yeah. negativity and, and, and stuff like that. And, you know, we, we've had to ban a few of them from the message board and stuff because they were just so yeah. ridiculously over the top and stuff. But but um, th- there's just been a lot of negativity. I mean, it's it's it was really, really bizarre. So I'm just, you know, kind of curious about that. Nah, I mean, I'm so excited about this football season. I'll be at the Georgia Tech game because that's probably the only one that I could geographically go to next this year that I'm going to be really, really excited about. I know there's other callers on there, but this is my last thing I just want to send out to you and Matt. Um, I'm not so disappointed if we don't get Trevante Citizen uh, tomorrow, and the reason why is I just Florida is just loaded in running backs next year. And I think Mario needs a year where he's probably going to be recruiting maybe two of those dudes to get on the team. Can you just talk about a little bit? I mean, this signing day is pretty much done. It's wrapped. I hope we get some more Stewart tomorrow. Be disappointed if we don't. But what can next year kind of bring? Because I see a top five class next year if we just end up with a record of 93 and a bowl win. Um, I just think there's just too much talent in the state of Florida next year to have a whole year to be recruiting that, to recruiting those guys to not be able to get. Can you talk about the 23 class? This is for you or Matt. Yeah, I'll let Matt take most out. of it, uh, but I'll just – start by saying yeah it's off the charts i mean uh somebody was giving me a hard time the other day because i was talking about maybe getting three running backs and you know there's no way all three of those great running backs are you know you know are are coming to to miami and uh you know but but i think back to the days when two or three great running backs did come to miami in a given year and this is an unusual year coming up so it's it's going to be interesting but uh you know, Matt, you've you've driven hard. You you dove hard into 2023 over the last month, and uh, why don't you just tell everybody what 
what your impressions are just of the quality of the class and the early traction that Miami seems to be getting. Yeah, well, you know, I never listen to your questions, so I'm going to just say my own thing anyway. So I, I just think philosophically, I, I am a big fan of taking one running back a year, almost treating it like a quarterback position, and then you need like one extra every three years. You know, we take two in one class, but you don't want to substitute quality for quantity. And the big thing that's missing from Miami right now, in my opinion, is a feature back. They have, um, I, I guess the closest guy to a feature back would be maybe be Don Chaney, but he's so fragile. It, it's hard to see him handling 20 carries and taking that pounding when he's really struggled already with a bunch of injuries. And then you got a bunch of sort of lighter backs. Not that there's anything wrong with that. You know, like, like I've said, I think Henry Parrish and Jalen Knighton can combine into one really good running back, you know, where you don't want those guys taking that pounding, but where they could each get 10 to 12 carries a game and two to three catches per each of them per game and do really, really well. Uh, but but there are guys out there, and Toronto Citizens, one of them, who are all around backs, and that includes, for instance, with Trevante. When I was talking to one of his coaches the other day, he said Trevante is the best pass protector he's ever seen at the high school level, and that's not even taking into account what a good runner he is. <laughs> you know, he's the he's the all around package. Um, he's an every down back. He's he's what you want. Like when you look at the ACC, the top back last year was at Syracuse. That's an every down back who other defenses have to plan for. And when that happens, it opens up the passing game, right? So when you have a running back, a Jalen Knighton or whoever, you know they're going to struggle running between the tackles. And that really helps the defense sort of take out other players that they're looking to take out, whether it's a tight end or a top receiver, whatever it is, you know, play a safety over the top. You don't have to worry about putting another safety in the box, whatever it is. That's why you need that guy. And as it relates to 2023, you know, Miami's already really targeting hard Mark Fletcher, and Richard Young, uh, I, I don't think Richard Young winds up at Miami, but I, I think Mark Fletcher is the guy that very well might wind up here, and he would be huge, 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 because he is that guy. He's the guy who can do everything. And if you guys have ever seen Mark Fletcher in person, it's, you know, I mean, Gary and I were here covering, you know, not Jay Davenport, Frank Young, I mean, Frank Gore, I mean, <laughs> I got Richard Young on the brain. Frank Gore, um, you know, you just go to Clinton Portis. You go on the list of the guys that we've covered at running back here, and those running backs have not been on the roster that type of running back over the last numerous years. Um, so this is Mark, Mark Fletcher, Fletcher reminds me of Alonzo Highsmith. Him, he looks, yeah, yeah, yeah. He looks like those old school running backs at Miami that were amazing, and that opens up the rest of the offense for you when that when that running game is so effective. And with Mario Cristobal and Alex Mirabal, you know they want that power downhill game and not, you know, they did it at Oregon with the lighter backs, but I think they prefer the downhill running game. And this is the guy who can do it. So if they can get Mark Fletcher next cycle, to me, that's all you need. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's all you need. Um, and if not him, then Richard Young. But I, I do, from what I've heard, I think Richard Young's a little bit of a long shot, even though it's so very early. All right. All right, Sebastian, does that uh... – Answer your no, question. That was, that, 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 no, that answered that answered all of my questions. I just, you know, you guys could just end off with this. Does the hiring of Kevin Steele is that enough of a game changer to bring Shamar, uh, Shamar Stewart over? Because, I mean, this guy can coach. I mean, he can coach defense. I mean, I just think the first game of the season, throughout the season, I just think he knows how to put a defense together that's going to keep you in game. And the ACC is not, you know, the primo conference. And, you know, like last year we saw you win some, you lose some. But I just feel like, you know, with Kevin Steele running the defense, he's going to keep us in a lot of games. What I'm really interested in is how can we best solidify this offensive line? But going back to my question, do you think hiring Kevin Steele is enough to tell just tell Shamar, look, you know, um, you know, you're going to have everything. Everything that Texas A&M is offering you, you're going to find that stuff here in Miami. And uh, do you really want to leave and take your family and go all the way over there? Like, who is that? A Harris kid from Booker T. Washington that did that a couple of years ago. And I don't even think he's saw the field um, since he's been at Texas A&M. So uh, I don't know. I don't know. I just want to know if you guys think Kevin Steele's a game changer. Um, I mean, we've got a defensive coordinator. So I don't. Give me a hope. I, I don't, Sebastian, uh, because I don't think Shamar Stewart or his advisor have any clue about anything having to do with Kevin Steele. And I think Kevin Steele right now, as we're sitting here doing this show, is probably on the phone with them. And 
and trying to sell them on himself and what he plans to do with the defense. And obviously the goal is going to be for it to be the tipping point. But, you know, it's kind of hard, in my opinion, for it to be a tipping point, you know, 12 hours before you can start signing the, the letter of intent. So, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, if Shamar Stewart comes to Miami tomorrow, I, I think it'll be because before Kevin Steele, he was seriously thinking he would sign with Miami. Matt, you agree? Disagree? I just, I just, I mean, I'll just add. I, look, I, I, I imagine they're going to wind up calling his defense the Steel Curtain defense at Miami, S T E E L E, for those of you Pittsburgh fans out there. But I, I, it, it is an interesting timing, right? Because <laughs> all Shamar's, you know, all Shamar's defensive line coach slash mentor said was missing from the equation from Miami was a defense coordinator. Now, like a miracle from heaven, there's a defense coordinator. And I did reach out to his defensive line coach before the show, and I said, hey, do you guys know anything about Kevin Steele? And he responded, no. <laughs> so not a great sign. But, um, but yeah, I'm sure they're going to have a conversation. Um, can it tip? Can it be a tipping point? I don't know, because Kevin Steele, like, the, Shamar really wants a 4-3 defense. And Kevin Steele has used so many different defenses for him to say, oh, you know, he can't say, I've always just used a 4-3 attacking defensive end defense. He can't say it because that's not what he's done. He's, he's really been multiple. He's used 4 3, three four. He's done some crazy stuff um, where he just has you know, but, but to but, but the story coached, on the site. He's coached so, national championship defensive linemen, you know. I mean, correct. national championship defensive, you know, teams, you know. Um, yeah, think, but you have to remember what, what is, kids want to know. Kids don't want to know. I know fans love to say, hey, look who he's coached. And, yeah, that works to some extent, but what a kid really wants to hear is how will you use me? What do you see when you look at my film? What will you, you, what will you do with me? Will I play as a freshman? What do you expect? And for Kevin Steele to answer those questions when he hasn't even looked at the Miami players in depth yet and try to figure out where Shamar Seward fits in as a freshman, it's, it's an impossible question to answer. And, yeah, it's great to say, hey, look who I've coached. But, you know, for a high school kid, a lot of times that, that's not really the end all be all, believe it or not. Okay. Hey, man, guys, great show, man. Appreciate the content and whatnot. I'm looking forward to exciting football season. I think, you know, recruiting this year is kind of like a wash. It's improved a whole lot since the coaching staff changed. I'm excited about what's on the horizon. Um, I just hope I have some good surprises tomorrow and not some bad ones. But uh, I'm just looking to see how the season just kind of unfolds and and, uh, see what the rest of the coaching staff look like. Uh, And uh, hope we get some – some 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 good people because the ones we lost between T. Rob and McClendon, I, those hurt. You know, there's, there's no way to kind of get around it. So, but keep got keep doing what you guys are doing. There's other people there that need to get on the phone. Just keep me on hold. Appreciate it. All right, Sebastian, thank you for being part of the show, man. All right, five six three nine 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 three five five zero five six three nine 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 three five five zero. You hit the one on your keypad if you would like to come on the show. Uh, let's go now to the seven two seven. You're live on Kane Sport Live. Hey, Gary. It's Jake from St. Pete. How you doing today? What's up, Jake? How you doing this evening? Doing great. Doing great. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm your negative guy on the uh, message board. <laughs> Maybe. I, let me, let me tell you, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, I like to, I like to say it. But, um, th- like, this hiring of, of Kevin Steele, it, you, you have to assume this is directed at Shamar Stewart. Why the hell wait? Like, um, your, your, your uh, guy yes, you yes were going no. I, I, I think he, I think he probably Friday rushed was it. Available. I'm sorry. You know, I, I, I think he probably accelerated it, Jake. You know, with with Shamar Stewart in mind. You know, thinking, you know, I, I need to do something to to, to turn this <laughs> final step in, in, in Miami's direction. Um, but make no mistake, Mario and Kevin Steele, I'm sure, have been talking for many, many weeks. I, Kevin well, Steele I'm didn't sure, have a job. But, he didn't have a job. I mean, Kevin Steele didn't have a job right now. No, but this is what I find infuriating about because I, I love the hire. Like it's Kevin Steele, he's a badass coordinator. Nobody's nobody's gonna take that away. Like he, he's a good coach, but. Like, I'm not even going to say, okay, maybe, you know, Mario had some guys in mind. He's got, you know, he, he's got people he wants to interview, and I'm cool with that. Fine. Hey, take your time. Take three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, whatever. 
you know, most of the other guys who I would call the high end coaches, uh, Brian Kelly, Lincoln Riley, so on and so forth. Those guys took until probably early to mid January to fill all of their coaching vacancies, but they had coordinators hired fairly quickly and high quality ones, not like, you know, garbage or anything. So it's just to me, like it, it, it's, he's such a good recruiter and I'm not, I'm not like downplaying his ability to recruit the guy Mario Cristobal is probably the best recruiter in college football because, you know, uh, he's never made the playoff. He's selling vision. So, um, you know, he, to get people to buy into that vision without having delivered on it is, is impressive. The, um, the, the point I, I've just been making on the board, and, I, you know, I, I've, I've probably hammered you a few times and whatnot, is just like it, it, seems, it seems like doing work just for the sake of doing work and that he could have made this hire a week ago. And then maybe Shamar meets with them over the weekend, and that's, you know, that one piece left. And it just seems kind of careless. Like if, if you were going to make it today, you could have made it last Friday. And then he could have met Shamar Stewart in person. And, you know, maybe that puts you in a better spot. It, like, it, it doesn't seem like this couldn't have been done, you know, any time other than right now today. So, uh, you know, that, that's, been, that's been one of my biggest, uh, uh, you know, issues with this whole thing. It's not like, look, let me say, when, when, I, when, when I say all this and all this criticism, I tripled my season ticket spending because we hired Mario. And I made uh, the first contribution I've made to the U in, in 10 years now, uh, monetary donation. So it's like, you know, I, I'm all in, but I just, especially with the coaching hires, because I, I think to me, Mario, he's never been a I mean, he was a coordinator for a year, but he, he's not an X's and O's guy. So to me, the I've just been <laughs> very in tune to what he's, He's doing with that because I, I think a lot of his success will will hinge or fail or succeed or fail based upon those guys he has around him. And, you know, his staff at Oregon was great for the budget he was working on, but it's like, you know, you got a big boy budget now, and Oregon hires aren't going to put you in the category of Alabama. Your Oregon hires aren't going to put you up there with Georgia or LSU or Notre Dame or these other teams making the playoff. And so – you know, like for me, it, it, you know, the time is definitely a frustration, but it's more like what could you have done with recruiting if, you know, you're getting a diminishing return by taking this long. I'm not saying don't do your due diligence, but like these hires could have been made a month ago. They could have been made two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Then, hey, maybe Dave Iuli knows his uh, uh, Frank Potts is going to be his offensive coordinator. They can, you know. It's it's just to me that that seemed a little careless or, or unnecessarily drawn out. You well, know, if this is our our problem, I, life's better than Manny. So, but let me ask you a question, Jake. What, uh, what if he wasn't blown away? Yeah. What if, what if nobody blew him away? Well, then like, you go to your fallback plan. But like, like well, that's what, what I think what he did. <laughs> but that's my point. Is that what? Why why your fallback plan nine weeks down the road instead of four or five weeks down the road? Like, nothing's changed. I know you like to say, oh, he was waiting for the NFL or this and that. We knew Dorsey wasn't coming from the get. The guy wants to be an NFL head coach. He doesn't want to deal with all the recruiting bullshit. I don't blame we, him. It's but when you're a recruiter like Mario is, you never NIL. consider something a done deal. Never. You fight to the end. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean that could have cost recruits. I, I, you know, again, if he makes the right hire, this is all. You know, it's like, oh, hey, if if we go ten and two, or you know, next season go to the uh, ACC championship game, are we going to sweat that? You know, Dave Iuli didn't come to to Miami. I won't. I'll tell you that. But uh, you know, it's just it just seems a little careless. That's all, or, or just a little unnecessary, and just. I base that off of the other high caliber coaches filled out a very good coaching staff in about three to five weeks. And, you know, we're on week number nine and, and now it seems rushed. And that, that to me, again, I'm probably splitting hairs with this, uh, you know, ask me uh, uh, next October if we're, uh, you know, 
seven and one or eight and zero, like Matt was saying, and I, I agree fully. Uh, ask me if I give a shit that it took an extra two, three weeks to to get it done, four weeks, whatever. Probably not, but it, it's just you know right right in the here and now. It just it, I think I might be speaking for some of the other guys. It just seems like especially with the way it's handled right now, where he just all of a sudden pulled the trigger, it just seems careless to me. That, that That's all. I, you know, it, it oh, is what it is. I, I'll, uh, I'll you know. tell you this, Jake. 75% of those coaches that made quick hires are, are, will get fired probably at least partially due to those quick hires. You think Jeff Levy's getting fired from Oklahoma? Or Matt no. House, who was one but of the how honest, many, But how uh, many Jeff Webbies are there? But that's my you're point. About one you guy, you're talking about one Jeff guy. Levy. Look at all the openings there were. Pull the trigger. And not to mention, like, so So last week you guys were talking about that 2023 elite recruiting day. And originally I thought that was going to be, like, you know, 20 guys from Florida. Okay, Mario can handle uh, – uh, that, but uh, that probably made a bad impression with some guys because you had, you know, what, ten people trying to handle two hundred recruits. Like, you know, if you had a full staff, it's probably still a little unwieldy, just given how many people wound up coming to that. But you know, you only get one chance to make a first impression, and and, and there's just a lot of negative recruiting. He can probably make up the ground on it, but you know, you never know. It, it's uh, um, what about uh, just. Uh, kind of, uh, kind of on that subject, but not. What? Because uh, yeah, I mean, you know, look. At, at the end of the day, like I said, he's going to make the hires. They're going to be. They are what they are, and hopefully, they're really good. And uh, we have a really great season. So you know, is what it is at this point. Nothing. <laughs> it ain't going to change uh, re- recruiting at, at this point, or at least for 2022. But um, what? What happened with T. Rob? Because that that really disappointed me. Um, cause you know, we, we've got a big boy budget now. Um, what, what happened there? I, I would say he had the opportunity to go to Alabama and he decided he'd rather be at Alabama. I mean, do you know that like Mario make a serious run at him or did he pretty much no, say I mean, Mario, like, you know, Mario he told him he had a job, like, Mar- you know, whatever, I don't know what the salary was or whatever, but whatever it was, I mean, he had a he had he Mario told him he had a job. I mean, there was it wasn't like T Rob had insecurities about whether he was going to be welcome at, at Miami. Mario had already told him he was he was going to be welcome at Miami. He just got the opportunity to go to Bama and decided that he'd rather go to Bama. And, and I I don't know if like I I'll tell you your word. I I'd imagine he you know he he did offer him, but like I never saw anything like confirming he was hired it always seemed like it was implied but it was never like confirmed i mean what, you know, was I could, that no i could tell you that he, i could tell you that he was he was hired i could tell you that oh okay okay no no the, 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 no that's legit then uh you know hey you got to remember yeah, when a guy is staying uh, if, if there's a coach like like steve field hasn't been announced either you don't have to make an announcement when the guy's already employed at a university and he's going to be retained on staff you don't have to make you don't have to make an announcement that he's hired. You're right. He's hired. See what I'm saying? But like, what, what is Steve Fields? Like, is, is he, is he a coach or? or... He's the tight ends coach. Until somebody decides that he's not anymore. Okay. Okay. Cause yeah, I don't, it just seemed like from what I was reading, like they were kind of stringing him along, like, Hey, let's see how you do with recruiting. Let's see how we mesh. And yeah, I thought maybe that was a situation where they didn't give him like, solid footing and then Alabama. No, uh, that, that Alabama is not true, Dick. That's not in. true. So, okay, no, no, cool. That's uh, No, I'm glad you clarified that because that was something that was kind of a little thorn in my side. But, no, it's, uh, you know, hey, uh, you know, that happens. Uh, it's, it, I'm sure Bama threw him some good money, and, hey, you know, it's not like guys haven't advanced their careers going there. So, you know, that that you can live with. I just thought his, his employment status was kind of – shaky or up in the air and you never got assurances so no that, that's good to hear so uh that, that's a lot easier pill to swallow hey what one other question i got for you and uh uh, uh <laughs> i don't know uh now now you're under the uh the, the payroll so to speak but uh you know i i've been one who who is skeptical of john ruiz um i don't like i don't want to be i don't want to be right on it stuff uh, uh mind you I, I love the fact that we got some money behind the program i love the fact that there's ex- 
excitement and things like this. But, you know, I, I look at like Nevin Shapiro and stuff like that. And, you know, uh, uh, there's, there's plenty of Nevin Shapiros in Miami. Uh, I hope, you know, John Ruiz is not one of those. I mean, he seems, he, he seems to be a fairly legitimate business guy, but, my biggest concern is, is you know, I, I've read up on this this Spock, uh, or, or the the minimal reading that, that's available with it, and you know, from from what little is out there, um, number one, a big financial transaction like that is going to make big news in, in the stock market, uh, on, the, on the TV shows, and there's really nothing about it. That would be the second biggest Spock ever. Uh, done and and I mean by by a lot. Uh, so my question is is like is he playing with for real money or is it, is it like oh hey yeah I think I'm going to be worth twenty five billion dollars and does this dry up if uh, you know because a lot of the reading I've been doing says that you know a lot of people on Wall Street think this thing's worth like ten percent or. 25% of what, you know, they're, they're anticipating uh, uh, taking it public with. And a, a lot of them say it's not worth anything or it's not going to happen. So, you know, he, he seems to have some money, but, you know, uh, $10 million a year on a, you know, 10 year span, that's a hundred million dollar investment. So, uh, you know, if you're worth $500 million, you can't swing that. I'm sorry. Nobody's going to do that. If you're worth $25 billion, yeah, it's pocket change. No big deal. You're having fun with it. You're doing your thing. So that's my big concern is that, like, you know, is the guy spending money he doesn't have or is, is this legit and he can cut these checks right here and now? Because that will make us look foolish if, uh, you know, if he's out there promising half the team well, all these, uh, you know, uh, five-figure deals, who knows, probably six-figure at some point with, uh, you know, Shamar – comes on board or something so it's like you know i, I just don't want to get burned and then you know we here's like what i'll tell you jake then... how are you going to get burned think about this for a minute these kids didn't have five cents before this okay well they had five cents they had they had their they, they had they had the, the minimal deals and i don't want to minimize what dan lambert did last year it was unbelievable he put a half a million dollars at that nil gave every player six six thousand dollars wait a minute jake wait wait, wait, wait. I'm, I'm gonna answer your question if you let me so okay, okay. Go, like go ahead. Go ahead. Each, each guy was getting six thousand bucks. Okay, so you know that's not nothing. But but in relation to what's going on now, it it, it, it was it was not a lot of money. And you know like what it, what is the, like what is anybody losing here? Let's say the worst case scenario: John Ruiz doesn't have as much money as he thinks he has um, over the course of the next year, two years, three years, whatever it is. He comes under hard financial times and. In, he defaults on his NIL contracts, and he no longer can do life wallet on a NIL with my, with Miami players. Life's going on, Jake. Like they're still going to be playing football. They're still going to have NIL deals with other people. The Moss brothers you, you don't certainly have billions of dollars. Recruited. Wait a minute, no, it won't, because there's going to be way more than what John Ruiz is doing. Uh, the Moss brothers are coming behind it with another huge NIL program. The Dan Lamberts of the world okay. aren't going to probably stop doing what they were doing. That's number one. Now, number two, here's what I will tell you. I had never met John Ruiz before he got involved in NIL. I had no preconceived opinions uh, of any type. I had wide open eyes. And like Matt, I had plenty of people in my ear saying, watch out for John Ruiz. He's had, a lot, he's had business deals through the years that have gone bad. Um, we got a guy on our site that's involved with Homestead that is still upset about what <laughs> happened. The at, going nuts about it. Yeah. 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 Like everybody, like everybody's got different perspectives for different, for different reasons. So Jake, here's what I'm telling you. I had no preconceived opinions on John Ruiz. I went into this totally open-minded. Okay. I, I started out, I met him at, um, it, it, I think the first time I met him, was at Mario's press conference. And I I think I'd spoken to him once before. I met him at Mario's press conference. It seemed like a like a good guy. I said, "Listen, I I want to come see you soon." And as soon as we get as soon as we get our feet under us, I want to come see you. About 3 4 5 days later, I reached out to him. He had given me his phone number at Mario's press conference. Um I set up an appointment with him. I went to his home. He invited me to his home. Okay, um, I went to his home, 
And we sat down, we talked for like 45 minutes. You saw the interview portion of that on Kane's Sports. Yeah, oh yeah. And I walked out of there very, very impressed. Uh, you know, I, I, I thought he was captivating. I thought he said the right things. He seemed to be in it for the right reasons. Uh, and I felt, I felt let relatively you, Gary, good. Let me tell you, Gary, this is something – well, let, me, let, me just fin- let me just finish. I'm going to try not to be too long-winded, well, yeah. and, then you, and then you could follow up, Jake. Let me just finish answering your question. <laughs> no, and, no, and I'm going okay. to try, go try not to be too long-winded here, but I think a lot of people are at, no, they, have the same, they have the same question you have, and they also mm-hmm. see that we just did Keep a marketing deal. Keep going. Yeah, we just did a marketing deal yep. with them this week. Yeah, like we are now, yeah. we are now. He is now a sponsor of our signature podcast every day. Yeah, um, I saw that on your show this morning. Yeah, and we are going to be showcased. And the reason we did that deal was not just to market Life Wallet, but because I, subsequent to that meeting at his house, I I went to a second event at his house, and that was one that all the players were at. And I'm looking at these kids. And the look in their eyes and the excitement. And, and I interviewed about a dozen of them, and I'm sure you saw the interviews on the website. And you could hear these kids, like, what these, what these relationships that they're forging with him are going to mean to them, going to mean to their families. And, and I started to buy in even more. Like, this is really going to be a great thing for Miami football. It's a great thing for these kids. Uh, it's a life changer for some of them. And I felt even better about it. Then, after that, I went to the next meeting he had with the kids. And this was at his office in Coral Gables. That is MSP Recovery Headquarters, where Life Wallet is now headquartered. He had all the kids come for a meeting at his corporate headquarters. And I'm watching him, like, you know, giving these kids life lessons. I'm watching him coach these kids on speaking and dictation, and they're filming commercials and learning how to market brands. And I'm saying, my freaking God, I've never seen Miami football players in the 40 years that I've been around the program getting taught these real life things that are going to that they're going to take with them for the rest of their, their life. And if they're successful in football, they're going to get other endorsement opportunities. And if they go into the business world, they're going to have to speak in front of people again. And I'm looking at these kids and, and the, the way they're lighting up and Gil, what this meant for Gilbert Frierson, what this meant for Don Chaney, who has a kid, he's got a kid at home and, and barely has the money to buy diapers and milk. Um, and now he does. And, and, and I'm looking at all this, Jake, and I'm absorbing all of this. And you know what? I said, look, this is a great thing. And I don't know if it'll last for a year, two years, three years, 10 years. Like, I have no idea how long it's going to last, Jake. But as long as it lasts, I'm telling you, and I've seen it with my own eyes, what is going on with these kids and this NIL program is off the chain. Okay. And as long as it's there, my feeling is if we can support it, we're going to. And that's why we entered into a marketing relationship with John Ruiz and why we're go- and, and what we are going to be showcasing is the work that the kids are doing um, for his company. It's, it's not going to be it's not just about John Ruiz. It's about the kids and what they're doing. And I want you guys to see it. And uh, you're going to see can, it. And, and, can and, I and interject uh, uh, just just so a couple of things. First thing, I hope to God any bad thoughts I have with this are dead wrong because I no, I, I love what he's doing with them. And I, I like the idea of, of teaching these kids, you know, nothing, nothing like, like hurts me more. I mean, yeah, that, like I'm not losing sleep over it, but you know, like when I see Clinton Portis, uh, you know, got probably made a hundred million dollars in his career and you find out he's broke. I hate seeing guys like that because all the success they had kind of goes down the tubes and then back to square one. So I, I love what he's doing there. And I said, I hope to God, I'm wrong. I really like this. Isn't something I'm not. I'm not bringing this up because like I want to destroy John Ruiz or anything. It's just there's some things I find fishy. Like the when I went on because I you know I went and checked out the Life Wall website. I'm like, what's this all about? What, what's going on? I, like, admittedly, that's not a billion dollar website. That, that, that's not a, a you know United Healthcare. That, that looks like a website you paid 500 bucks to have put together. I wouldn't like I, I clicked through it one. I wouldn't put my financial information on it. So I'm just like, you know, I, I just have questions there. Like, you know, the guy comes out of nowhere 
And, you know, and, and to your point, everything he's doing, I believe that. And I believe that this is impacting a lot of people's lives. But, like, you know, they've gotten check number one at 12. So three months down the road, if this rug gets pulled out from under him, this deal doesn't go through, like, these kids were counting on this and they were planning for it. That's a bad look. You know, that, that's, all, that's my thought, at least. And, and, again, like I said, I hope to God I'm dead wrong. I, I would love nothing more. I hope this guy for the next 10, 20 years is, is a huge benefactor. He's our Phil Knight. I, but it's just like, you know, it, it, a lot of the rules of the playbook, most of the guys kind of play behind the scenes. You know, Phil Knight maybe a little not, but like the Moss brothers and, and uh, Marcus Lemonis and all those guys, they kind of operate, uh, you know, in the shadows, so to speak. And, you know, you don't tend to see guys looking for all this big publicity. Everybody's got different styles, Jake. Everybody's got different styles. Everybody's got different personalities. Uh, This guy is brash. He's he's unquestionably uh, sought attention along the way. And that rubs some people the wrong way. Some people don't like that. Some people are jealous. Some people are threatened by it. And everybody's entitled to all their different reactions. You know, that that's part of being a human being. Everybody reacts to everything differently. I'm just telling you, I've seen what he's doing with my own eyes, and I think he's going the extra mile to make it legitimate that he's not just handing money to the players. I think they really are doing, and I'm going to put it in quotes, work, because everybody will define that differently. Some people think work is different things and, and whatever, and, and that's up to the individual opinion holder. But I think he's doing everything he can to make it uh, a legit, uh, uh, productive program for these kids. And because there's so many people that doubt it, everywhere that they go and everything they're doing, it's all being recorded. <laughs> so that if anybody ever questions okay, the legitimacy yeah, hey. of what he's doing, it's all documented and recorded. As, I, as I'll tell you, I hope this is one, uh, looking down a year, two years, five years, I, I, this is one I will say I hope I am so dead wrong on it, and, uh, and my, my thoughts were entire, entirely misplaced. Uh, yeah. I, would, I would be very happy to be entirely wrong on this one, so I, I hope you are entirely right. Um, well, I'm not, just, yeah, I'm not I, saying I'm right or wrong. I, I'm just commenting on what I've seen with my own eyes. You know, I mean, I see I see kids like really benefiting from this in, in every way, not just financially, but culturally, um, business, learn, they're learning about business, they're learning, they're going to be learning about what to do with their money and how not to blow it, things like that. Like, like this is more than just, hey, I'm sending you a check every month. All right, Jake, let me let you run. Yeah. Let some other people get on. Yeah, I hope yeah, I answered yeah. your good, question. Good stuff. Appreciate um, it. Yep. yep. If you have, have any more one. questions, just post them on the message board. I got you covered. Will do. Have, have a easy. great night, Jake. All right, um, Matt Shodell, I promised you an hour, so we're we're at that point. So um, be, before we let you go, uh, give us your closing thoughts going into National Signing Day. Oh, I'm surprised you didn't want to ask me about John Ruiz. I thought that was going to be my big uh, moment. <laughs> <laughs> but the listen, that guy actually was was um, he made some good points. I mean, the SPAC he mentioned, you didn't even mention the SPAC, but SPAC is something a lot of people don't know about. It's basically a way to keep finances private instead of going public, which, you know, is a little bit of a red flag for some companies. But, yeah, like, you know, Gary, you're a trusting, nice person. I'm a New Yorker. That's the difference. So that's why – those of you who watch Good Morning Kings, that's a little – No, wise, I'm actually – I'm usually but, skeptical. But I, I, I mean, I had – I've just seen it with my own eyes. And, yeah. you know, look, we can't predict the future. Like, we don't know what's going to happen a year from now, two years from now. I mean, people have highs in business. They have lows in business. Uh yeah. You know, I mean, listen. The guy I, seems like he's doing great things for Miami. So as long as he keeps doing it and follows through on his on his word, I mean, this is great. You can't, you know, you can't do anything but admire the guy for that. So, and there's no signs right now that that's not going to be the case. So everything looks good. Um, but you know, but yeah, I mean, there's there's, there's obviously you know, and I both have, have heard some red flags, but those are from the past. You know, I mean, I mean, everything right now seems really good. I mean, the guy's um, an yeah, attorney. The guy's an attorney, Matt. He's been right, an attorney. Right. He he's been a business guy for a long time. When you're in business and you're in law, it's not all hunky dory. There's winners and there's losers in every case. The losers are pissed. You know, everybody in South Florida is not John Ruiz's best friend. I mean, right? And yeah, I mean, we had people tell us how. Well, you mentioned the Homestead deal where he reneged on a stadium that he was supposed to pay for. Then you hear how he was foreclosed on. I mean, you hear these things that happen, and it's like, what? It doesn't make any sense because you're at his house. 
You're living in this basement, and he's got yachts in the back. He's got a beautiful <laughs> house with a giant pool, right? I mean, it's like how can the, the, it doesn't it doesn't um, you know it doesn't match up to what people tell you. So it's it's super, Listen, weird, I, super I, weird. I thing, have but been it's great. I've been impressed, super impressed by every interaction and everything right. I've seen from John Ruiz. Now, right. it, you know, yeah. it, no, it, seems, it, it, it seems like it lesson. He's, until he proves otherwise, there's no reason to doubt him, right? Ex- I mean, exactly. Like the exactly. Past, so from the past. Yeah, and I'm not going to judge him based on business deal he had with somebody in Homestead ten years ago. That's not my business. Right. Like Correct. you know, you know what I'm saying. Right. You gotta, I'm you judging gotta, him. A guy who's doing this. A guy who's done this for Miami Hurricane players, you have to give him the benefit of the doubt until something happens. You have to just say, this is the best thing in the world. Because, I mean, a guy who wants to throw money and help Miami players, like, how can you say that's a bad thing? I mean, you just have to, you have to give him the benefit of the doubt. But anyway, as for, as for the what you have, closing thoughts on signing day? Um, well, you know, there's no closing thoughts until signing day is over. I mean, Miami, I, I would tell people have – I think the Miami Miami's having their press conference at I think it was three thirty. Is that right with uh, with Mario? Four p.m. Sorry, yeah. So so stay tuned for that. We'll be on our sites. Four p.m. tomorrow. We'll and have, I don't know how they're even going to do that because some of the kids aren't announcing till after that. So I don't. I mean, well, so the the only one who's not going to announce by that time is is Dave Uly, and they certainly could have done it at seven p.m. and been able to talk about him. They won't be able to talk about him by name at all. Usually, I've never seen them have a press conference where anybody signed after the day after the time they had the press conference. I've never seen it happen, so I don't know what that says about Dave Uly or not. But it's not possibly not a great sign, <laughs> you know. Because obviously, if you're the Miami Hurricanes, you want to promote your class and say how great it is, and to not have arguably, you know, one of the top prospects in the country sign with you that you can talk about it makes no sense to do your press conference before that so probably not you know if you're reading the tea leaves like gary likes to say which i read i read coffee grinds gary i don't drink tea i'm not like you so if you're reading the coffee grinds <laughs> probably not a great either. sign <laughs> but it is but it is what it is so yeah so so parting thoughts i i i still think that they get four to five guys i really do I, the big one is going to be shamar we're gonna have full covers on the website of course um, Gary's going to be there, and uh, I think, Gary, you said you're going to actually look under the table when you get there and see which jersey is in the bag he has under the table, right? So we'll let everyone know before he announces where he's going, so that'll be great. <laughs> and uh, to me, that's that's the big moment because Shamar Stewart, uh, whoever they get tomorrow is great, but Shamar Stewart is the sign because if you get Shamar Stewart in a month and a half of work, whereas a month and a half ago before Mario was hired, the kid and his coach both told us, he was planning to go to Texas A&M. That was the leader until Mario got the job. If Mario wins out with a five-star from Miami in a month and a half, it will tell you everything you need to know about the direction this Miami program's headed with local top prospects that they target. If he doesn't get Shamar Stewart, I wouldn't read into it too much because it's only been a month and a half where Texas A&M's recruited this kid for a much longer period of time and been able to develop that and get him on campus a ton with that staff. So really, it's a win-win for Mario, right? Because you get him, it's it's an oh my gosh moment, and you don't get him, it's a well we didn't have a coordinator until the last second, and we only had a month and a half to work, and he was already leaning somewhere else because of the issues Manny Diaz had trying to recruit the kid. So really, to me, it's 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 either going to be a great moment for Mario, or uh, oh well, we really never had a chance moment. And um, and and if it's the former and not the latter, it's just it's going to blow the lid off. I think South Florida recruiting because that, that makes national waves. Five star stays home. You know, it's such a great story uh, for the Miami hurricanes to, to go into the 2023 class with, with all these five star and four star local kids that they're trying to land. And, and they can say off this momentum, like, look, this is what we are doing. We are keeping everyone home. We are winning championships with kids from South Florida. And then of course they're going to cherry pick nationally, but that's the message and and Manny, Manny Diaz, I know you don't want to hear his name, Gary. He who can't be named, whatever you want to call him. His thing was, we only want to get kids who are going to come here. We don't want to have losses on signing day. We don't want it to look bad on signing day. And they would recruit lesser level kids. So kudos to Mario for going hard after some of these guys that he's trying to get. And if he doesn't win out on signing day, fans are disappointed. Oh, well. Because at least he tried. You know? That says something, right? Because previous staffs have not tried for some of the kids that Mario's trying for in a month and a half of work with half a staff. So all you complainers and negative Nelly, Ned, Nancy, Billy, Bobby's out there, which I've been called that numerous times. This is not tomorrow's not going to be the time for that. No matter who says no, who's considered a failure by 
you know, like Mario, which we just talked about. It's not really um, failures are to be expected. The wins are just nice on top of it. That That's my parting thought. That's it. Yeah, and it means a lot. You're right. And uh, it means enough to hire a defensive coordinator the night before signing day, and that's what he did. So uh, wish Kevin Steele luck uh, in his efforts with Shamar Stewart tonight that we know are going on. And, um, Matt, thanks for uh, making a cameo here on the, in the in the uh, the war zone that we uh, that we call Kane Sport Live, and um, I guess we'll we'll talk to you first thing in the morning. <laughs> All right, thanks for having me on. Enjoy the rest of the All show. Right. All right, Matt, thanks for being part of it. All right, five six three nine 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 three five five zero five six three nine 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 three five five zero. You hit the one on your keypad if you would like to come on the show. Um, let me see where I'm at here. Let's go out to the 205. You are live on Kane Sport Live. Hey, Gary. How's it going? Doing good. Who's this? This is JC4 in Birmingham. What's up, man? How you doing this evening? I'm doing good. Doing good. Got a couple questions for you. So if you're in the Texas A&M camp, what makes you feel good about Shamar Stewart coming? Like, Because I, I just don't get the – the hype with Texas A&M. I think James Coley is one of the best recruiters in the country. I'm hoping somehow Mario figures out a way to get him on his staff here at Miami. I don't know that he's going to be able to unless he makes them offensive coordinator. Uh, but James Coley is one of the best recruiters in the country, has been for many, many years, and is great, knows, knows a million people, is great with relationships, and he did a very good job early with Shamar, and they got him to College Station several times. And uh, once you're there, and, and I could speak from experience because I actually was there over the summer. I went there for a business meeting, and I actually went to visit James Coley while I was there. And I got a tour of all their facilities and everything, you know, um, which I like to do whenever I get a chance because it gives me good knowledge and it gives me a good frame of reference as to what the other people have. You know, we're always talking about facilities here at Miami and I wanted to see what they had. And it wasn't just about what they had. It was about what they were getting ready to do too. And uh, they have a lot of money out there and there's a lot of booster support and they have taken this NIL thing and run with it. There's, there's a lot of NIL support out there. Uh, a lot of, of their support, uh, corporate support is getting behind NIL, and it's just a it's just a well run program with Jimbo now as the head coach, and and they did a good job recruiting Shamar. And Miami was always there, but quite honestly, I mean, putting Manny and the program level that it was being run at up against what was going on at Texas A and M, it, it just wasn't a comparison. And and they got their their claws into Shamar. And and now you have Mario coming in here and in seven weeks trying to, you know, declaw de- de- declaw Texas A and M and and get those hooks out from Shamar and and get him to come to Miami. And it, it, it's it's turning out to be a tougher battle than I know I thought it was going to be. I, I've been you know, thinking by now that Shamar would be locked into Miami, and I don't think that's the case. I think they're fighting tonight, right now, as we're sitting here talking. I think they're fighting into the evening uh, on the phone right. with Shamar. I'm sure Mario's on there. I'm sure Kevin Steele's on there, and I'm sure they are making their final uh, pitch to him to come be a Miami Hurricane, and uh, that's what Texas A&M is going to have to survive. And um, right. what's going to happen? We're going to find out tomorrow at one o'clock. I imagine it might even continue into tomorrow uh, on the phone. And um, I, I, don't, I don't know. I can't predict how it's going to end. Yeah, you you say that, and I totally get where you're coming from. And the key word I gain from what you're saying is Texas A&M has that infrastructure in place of a big big program, but you have to believe that despite the fact that Miami doesn't currently have that in place, that they're pitching to Shamar, that they will have that in place, and once that's in place, there are national championship ceilings at Miami, and with all that in place at Texas A&M, they're still finishing third, fourth, fifth in their division year in and year out, 
because it's not like Alabama's going anywhere or Georgia. And they lose games to Auburn. They lose to LSU. And you can make the you could negative recruit Miami all you want, but things as a from a program perspective are certainly on the upswing from an infrastructure and facilities standpoint. You you say yourself, John Ruiz is going to uh, put together this NIL program that's going to be competitive with any other school in the country. So if that's your concern, that should be eased. And I understand that. Texas A&M and some of the schools in the Southeastern Conference, I I live in Birmingham, SEC headquarters are downtown. They get some more protection from the NCAA than programs like Miami, who have to be very ticky-tacky and play by the rules. Otherwise, they get their hands slapped. But, I mean, Texas A&M isn't winning games. You you could knock, well, Miami isn't really winning games either, but Texas A&M hasn't even competed in the SEC championship game since joining the conference, at least Miami's been to Charlotte, got embarrassed, but if we're going to expand the playoff and we're going to put in more teams, I mean, the opportunity to play in national championship games on a national scale and be relevant, it's almost as if Shamar Stewart could be the recruit that turns the tide for this next phase of Miami football. And it just doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, clearly I think there's some – foul play going on in their camp, but I just don't understand the hype. I mean, what are your thoughts on all that stuff? I I just think they've done a good job recruiting them. You know, they've gone against everybody. I mean, Shamar went everywhere. He went to Ohio State. He went to to every school around, and Texas A&M emerged from that as the leader. Uh, Even Georgia, which just won the national title, hasn't been able to get a leg up on Texas A&M or Miami. So, uh, Listen, I mean, they've Miami's given it its best shot. Like I said, I'm sure Mario and Steele are fighting into the night here tonight, probably into the wee hours of the morning, and with the intent of not taking no for an answer. And uh, we'll see what happens. We'll find out tomorrow at one o'clock. No doubt. I got. I got another quick. Speaking of Steele, I think it's an A plus hire. Um, played college football here in Birmingham. Um, a smaller school um, that had a lot of Auburn people involved. Uh, when he was at Auburn, he does a great job of utilizing this talent that he has and wrapping his defense around that. So I think that's an A-plus hire. As far as the offensive coordinator front goes, I, I've talked to you before on the show about this guy. Have you heard anything about Mark Elfrich, a guy that's got Oregon background, have not. spread up tempo off? I mean, he's working for Fox right now. I mean, even yeah, as an analyst would have not heard him mentioned at all. Yeah. What have you heard as far as offensive coordinators go? Outside, I'm hearing a lot of Frank Ponce conversation right now. I've even heard a little James Coley, but uh, I don't know that anything's happening there at this point. Um, you know, I think that's a little bit more of a difficult hire just because. He was the offensive coordinator here under Al Golden, and it ended in a not so great way. Not necessarily his fault, but you know, I think it's it's a little bit more of a difficult hire to to, to sell to everybody. Um, I think the fact that he was fired at Georgia gives Georgia an opening to say, "Oh man, we fired that guy. He's no good." You know, you know, it just it leaves a lot of openings that that you know might work against that happening. Even though I personally believe that when you factor in the way that he can recruit, that it might be one of the better um, better options. But, um, you know, that's what I'm hearing right now. I'm hearing a lot of Frank Ponce as a candidate. What are, what are the, the pros of hiring Ponce? Because I, I really I, – I think that would be a, a downgrade from Brett Lashley. And Brett Lashley is, a, is, is a truly a upper-tier offensive coordinator. That's why he's a head coach now. Yeah. I mean, do you think that – would be would be on par, or would it be a step down? I, I you know we don't know because there's just not he, he doesn't have that kind of sample size. He doesn't have a, that kind of track record um, as a coordinator at, at the upper tier of college football. I mean, you know, I don't want to sit here and down talk him for no reason. I mean, I, I just I I don't know. I I I just he just he doesn't have the same level of experience as like a Coley 
for, you know, for, for starters, um, you know, I don't know who is making themselves available to Mario right now. Like, who is he picking? Who is he picking between? Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't. It's hard for me to answer that question. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say Frank Ponce isn't good enough because because I don't really know. Like, I haven't. You know, there's nothing for us to judge by. Right, and per, and personnel goes a long way in calling offense. There's there's no doubt. No about question that. about it. No doubt. Personnel goes a long way. Speaking of coaching, though, I mean, uh, do you are you familiar with like the offensive line stats? I, I think there are like offensive line stats on the internet somewhere. I think Football Outsiders does. Have you heard uh, of that? No, I have not. Well, it, it, obviously, we. It, it, I'm sure you noticed as all Canes fans did. That third and short, fourth and short, the offensive line was it was just cringy at times. Difficult. We couldn't push people. Mm-hmm. Well, according to the, the stats, the, the football outsiders, the team that led the country last year in stuff rate in regards of third and short, fourth and short, moving people, which is to me is physical offensive line play, was Oregon. So I think that that's something that shouldn't be slept on and going into the next year, if we can somehow find a way to coach up the offensive line to be more physical. And I think that's going to be a part of the... I promise you that will take place. Good. I think I think if that part of the offense changes, then the offense is going to be enough, is going to be very successful again. But uh, I don't have a lot more. I appreciate all you guys do, and I love Good Morning Game Sport. I watch it every morning on the way into work. Um, last last little tidbit: Have you seen Shamar Stewart's Instagram? I have not. Not recently. No. Why? What's on there? He deleted every single post except him in his Miami pictures from last weekend's visit. Really? It's just when, him. When did he do right? that? Yep. Yesterday. Well, Yesterday. And today he posted one, just him and Miami stuff. I'm surprised you huh. haven't, no one's told you that. No, nah, it's the first I'm hearing of that. I don't know whether I would come to a conclusion from that anyway. Listen, yeah, if, if, think if, if he yeah. does not go to Miami, that means he's been trolling Miami all along, let's be honest. Because he's been there a million times. He's, you know, I mean, he's given the impression Miami's doing well with him. I mean... If he goes to Texas A&M, that means he never intended to go to Miami, in my opinion. Right, and in my in my my sentiment is is having gone on those recruiting visits, and you and you go to a place so many times, you you meet friends on the team, and that's clear in this case. And if you do something like that, you're posting everything just Miami stuff on your Instagram, and then you troll an entire team of guys that you've gotten to know over the last couple of years. I don't think it's going to be taken very well. Right. Well, no, we'll see. We will see. We'll see. That's all I got. I appreciate you taking my call, and I love Good Morning King Sport. I love all your content. I appreciate all the hard work you guys do there. So Thank you so much, get man. We, good news. We, we appreciate you as well. Okay. Take it easy. Have a great night. Yep. Uh, 563-999-3550, 563-999-3550. You hit the one on your keypad if you'd like to come on the show. We're going to go now to the 786. You're live on Kane Sport Live. 786, you with us? Going once, going twice. All right, you'll have to call back. Let's go to the 973. You're live on Kane Sport Live. Gary, Gary. Yeah. What's up, Ross? How you been, buddy? What's going on, man? We're going. Hey, listen. About that erasing stuff and only have the Miami stuff on. He's done that with every team along the way. It's almost like his countdown. I don't follow him, but I know that to be the fact. He's done that before, and you're going to have other people probably get on here and tell you that, too. So he's doing what he has to do. He has people that's behind him showing – you know, he's been doing stuff like this forever. So it's a show. These guys want the, the maximum attention before signing day. 
They want all eyes to be on them. It's very competitive because there's other guys, the top guys are going to commit too. So they try to do everything that they can to get all eyes on them. It's a big deal to these kids. So don't buy into that. If he picks Miami, he picks Miami. I know people are not going to be popular. It's not going to be a very popular thing I'm going to say. I'm hoping that we get other guys on the defensive line. Well, I would love to get them. It will be icing on the cake. But let's let's stack other guys too. Let's get other guys. Let's go some of these other. I like I like the fact that we're getting offensive line, big big mollies, big big hog mollies. Okay, I want big hog mollies on, on offensive line. I'm I want, I'm not going to focus on one kid. He's a he's a huge kid if you get him. But let's fill all the other stuff that we need to fill too. And while he if he picks another school and he's moved on, we move on and we continue to stack and get the trenches together and get the team together, because we must move on after that decision if he doesn't pick us. Can't allow something like that to, to, to damn near try to cripple us. Everybody, every year or so, we get caught up in stuff like that, and it bothers the fan base for a long time. And now people are going to want to criticize Mario or not. Stop the bullshit. Stop it. He picks us, he picks us. If he don't, we move on quickly. Get, Go ahead and just move on. Mm-hmm. What's your thoughts? Yeah, how do you do? You have a choice. <laughs> no, it's not about choice, but I mean, it should be a new mentality. If I'm saying, stop being a prison to one guy. I mean, I don't think they're a prison to one guy. It's just he just happened to be the highest profile guy that was left on the board. Yeah, I mean that's the trick what, bait that we get in every year, down. though. We, yeah, let's well, move on. If he doesn't pick us, let's move on. You won't have a choice. You have to move on. And let's stack that position. Let's get some linebackers in here. Let's get this team together. Let's get in shape. Let's look like we know what we're doing. And let's play the schedule. And move on. We could get other players like him soon. But get the team together. Get it sound. Get that foundation and culture together. Let's get that. Let's fix that. Let's fix that. Mario's on his own time. He's not on your time. It's a new gotta agree. Game. Gotta gotta agree with you on that, Ross. Put me on. I highlight you. All right, Everybody, man. what's up? Thank, right. thank you for being part of the show. Let's go to three one eight. You're live on King Sport Live. Hey, what's going on, Gary? You know it's this Port City Kane over here. Uh, what's up, Port you City? You didn't come to visit me this year. <laughs> you didn't come <laughs> to visit me this year. Love you, but I hope I never come to visit you again. Hey, look, man, if you do, then just visit me as a friend and not as a guy. Yeah, okay. Right? Yeah, as long as, it's not for, as long as it's not for the bowl game. <laughs> yeah, it is. But I want to say this. Shamar no, I'm kidding. I, I, I enjoyed your town. Your town was cool. Okay, but let me say something. Shamar Stewart is a unique talent. I mean, mm-hmm. to make no mistake about it, this ain't about a guy that's rated high. It's just when you got those kind of guys, uh, in the New Day defense, man, you kick that guy on them passing downs, you kick that guy to that defensive tackle, and he has a mismatch against any guard that you put in. He's different from Nigel Lee Kelly. Nigel Lee Kelly is a great tenant. Cyrus Mouse is a great tenant. But he's ready right now. And then the thing about it, it's an immediate impact. And when you got those kind of guys, because really the football is a line of scrimmage game. It's a line of scrimmage game. It's about three things, pass throwers, pass rushes, and pass protectors. And when you got the old guys, you got them, I sure hope that uh, things turn around because he's a unique talent. He's different from He was different from Marvin Jones. He was different from Nigel Lee Kelly. He was different from the rest of those guys because the rest of those guys weren't actually grown men yet. This is a grown man. You can, put, you, you can see him in a rotation immediately because he's physically ready to do it. You know, and and that's the reason why you know if you don't have a if you don't have a franchise quarterback that's a state guys like like Shamar Stewart are dead prize because even when you look down the down the rest of it, it's not guys that's really like that guy. It's just not. I mean, six six two seventy two as a as an incoming freshman. I mean that 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 is something that's unique and. The one thing about it, it, if you got a guy like Shamar Stewart, especially on those passing downs, when you can come in with your best pass rushing uh, package and have him as a defensive tackle, I mean, it, he's just like Demarcus Lawrence to the Dallas Cowboys. He's just unique. When he, when guys like that get on the field, 
your defense create more turnovers. They 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 limit how many how many uh yards gonna be put against them in every play. And he just I think I think he 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 he's all it. But I just the only thing that I feel like is this right here is just that uh I wish and this is my only qualm that I have with, with Mario is this. Is I just didn't want he seemed like to me he got in a fight with his hands tied behind his back. That he really needed a full staff to be able to pull this thing off in the number of weeks that it did. I'm not saying it, whatever his timetable is his timetable, but you know, uh he really needed uh he really needed a full staff in place. And some of the time I think what's lost but but between some fans is is when you hire offensive coordinators and defensive coordinators, many of them in their uh negotiating, they want they want some of those slots taken by their people. And that's the reason why you have these holes because they may, when you're going out the high profile guy, that guy might say, I want the linebacker's guy to be my guy. Or I want the wide receiver guy to be my guy. Because that's the same way with Red Lashley. Red Lashley came in and it was a couple of guys that um, that Manny gave him the latitude for him to hire because they want their guys. And you can't just fill those slots and then all of a sudden, that 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 you you kind of box your uh, offensive coordinator and your defense coordinator in because they really want to have some familiarity on those on those sites and I think that's a tough thing. I really wish we would have went head on and just uh, had a full staff. I think it would have really helped. It would have uh, lended some clarity because you know you got to know what you're selling, no matter what. You got to know. So what here's you're selling. my question, Court City. Yeah. Let's say he had a complete staff. Does it change anything? Like who 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 would they be getting that they're that you know they, like what would have changed? Well, I think what it, what I'm saying is is that if you don't have a full staff, what I mean by it is it kind of limits to me because a lot of these people had the layers of staff there, layers that you can drive at home a lot better. You know, you drive home. It's just like what well, this is. It's the same thing with uh. What you saying with Shamar Stewart, with him saying it, this is what I can do with you. Because that's the same thing Matt Shadell said. What can, what can you do with this kind of talent? What can you do with me? And if you got a full staff, you can say, this is what I can do with you. And when you come back in there, then it's not just that. But you're not right now because you're at the tail end of 2022. You're really projecting in 2023, too. So you're trying to all of that, like you're you're on the clock for 2023 too. So you trying to get if you got a full staff, then you're still you know uh, getting in there, getting it to your 2023 guys, and and having more hands on deck to deal with a lot of the court. Because it's the same thing with with Shamar. Shamar different from Najee. He's different from Cyrus. He's different from them, and a whole different animal. Because those are trick, tra- what you would call your edge rushes. But Shamar Stewart is a three-down defensive lineman. Even when you get in there, I think Najee will grow to be that. I think Najee Leek, and I think what uh, what Cyrus brings to it, I think he's a three-down player too. But I'm talking about instantaneously as a three-down player. And how do you how do you uh, put his talents to you? Because it's a lot of guys, and what they really are, are petrified of is they're petrified of, hey, look, I got a coach that's not maximizing uh, my talent and my capability because from the time they get on that field, especially guys uh, like the Shamar Stewart of the world, they're projecting to the NFL. That's what they're doing. They want to win some games, but they want to most most definitely project to be because they've already secured. They by the time they was what in the tenth or eleventh grade, they secured all the offers they wanted. They secured all of them. So now it's not about uh, where you got guys like Inez that's coming in who's fighting, scratching and clawing just to get into a program. Well, for those guys, they done already secured it. That's the, that's the reason why Evan Neal is going to be the top pick in the draft. Because in the 10th and 11th grade, he done already secured all this. He secured every offer he wanted to secure. And from 10th and 11th grade, I'm no longer concentrating about college. I'm trying to see how I'm projected to the NFL. And that's what I'm saying about how does it help. It helps you because you can close the deal – on the 2022 
and, and still start the fight because it's going to be a dog fight to get them receivers. Even though you got a whole lot of receivers down there in South Florida, got a whole lot of skill position, it's going to be a dog fight for those guys. It's going to be a, a – a, I mean, it's going to be fog of war right now for them because it, everybody in there know that, hey, look, man, you got to get that type of talent if you want to have any chance of being in the top four and being able to dethrone whoever's there. You got to have – it's the ingredients and not just the cook. You got to have the ingredients. If you ain't got the ingredients, get what? You you just got a fire. <laughs> You just got some smoke. So yes. that's what I think it would. But my main thing is, is that, you know, I think that Mario's doing a good job. I just think that uh, every situation is different. I, like I say, I wish that he had hired some people, you know, earlier, but it is what it is, you know. It is what it is, you know. And all right, that's, that's, that's all, that's well, all right, then thanks, you take it easy, th- bro. Th- thanks for your input, man. Appreciate it. Okay. All right, 563-999-3550, 563-999-3550. Hit the one on your keypad if you want to come on the show. I'm going to put a uh, – I got one or two guys left on the board, but I'm going to put out a final call for tonight for calls. So if you want to get on the show, um, get get in the queue now. Uh, let me uh, take a quick sip of water here, and then I'm going to zip through some of the questions that were submitted on the message boards at canesport.com. Um is there a concern that Mario is lacking decisiveness or that he's overthinking the coaching hires? Listen, here's what I'll say. Every year we watch dozens of coaches at every level, college, NFL, get fired from their jobs. Uh, they, don't do, they don't do a good enough job. They don't put a good enough staff together. Okay? Um, here we see a guy that is putting incredible thought and effort into every hire he's making. And you know what? If I'm going to make a, a mistake, I'm going to do it that way. And, uh, you know, I don't have any problem with the timeline. I don't have any problem with the fact that he didn't make knee-jerk hires. I think it's kind of obvious that maybe it didn't go as smoothly and as perfectly as he would have liked it to. No argument there. But that's life, man. When do you know... Everybody goes through all kinds of things in life where things don't go as perfectly and as smooth as they would like for them to go all the time. So uh, he hired Kevin Steele as defensive coordinator, a very experienced guy. Uh, you know, guys, he's, he's had some more, more success in certain places than others. Uh, we have no idea what would happen here at Miami. But if he had started out with Kevin Steele, I, I mean, I don't think everybody would have been going, oh, my God, that stinks or anything. So, you know, he ended up in an okay place with a guy that's coached a lot of football. You got a lot of experience there. Um, we'll see what the results will be. I, I had no problem with the timeline. I had no problem with the number of interviews he did, problem with the level of thought that he has put into putting his staff together. Um Losing BMAC was a huge blow. He highly valued BMAC, no question. Um, T Rob was never really his guy, so hard to really say there. But uh, it, it's come with ups and downs, no doubt about it. But uh, I would rather a guy do it the way Mario's done it than just make knee jerk hires. Like, how do you feel about James Franklin just boom making a snap hire of Manny Diaz to be his defensive coordinator? Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. We'll see. But uh, would you have been happy if Mario made a, a snap higher like that? Not necessarily. Is the optimism and excitement of the fan base setting Mario Cristobal up to be perceived as failing? Um, it might be in the short term. Uh, in the long term, no, absolutely not. He's going to fail or succeed based on the level of program that he could put together and based on the results of that program. And it's not going to matter whether the fan base is excited or, or full of Debbie Downers. It's the, the results are going to speak for themselves. And uh, so we'll see what happens tomorrow. We'll see what the reaction is. Maybe the expectations are setting him up to be perceived as failing. If they, if for example, he does not get Shamar Stewart, if he does get Shamar Stewart, it's going to be a great success. So we'll see what happens. Um, any chance of James Coley and Ponce as a co-OC situation? I don't know that I see that. Um, I don't see Coley going for that. Um, 
I, I would be shocked if it played out that way. I, I, I think it would have to be one or the other uh, and not both, but we'll see. When is the spring game? Okay, um, I'm going to have to look at a calendar real quick. It's going to be that middle Saturday in April, um, as it often is. I think you're going to see spring practice. April 16th, that Saturday, is when I believe the spring game will end up being. Um, I think spring practice will start in March, uh, probably that weekend of the 6th or something. Then I think they'll take a week off for spring break like they always do, and then they'll come back for three the final three weeks of spring after that with everything concluding uh, on that Saturday, April 16th. Uh, I'm being asked to comment on the latest staff defections of T-Rob and McClendon. I think I've already kind of done that. Uh, the deal with uh, McClendon was his family – really wanted them to be in Georgia. They, you know, the thing that we don't see, I mean, I see it a little bit because I'm, 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 cl I'm closer to it, but is the toll that these coaching situations and responsibilities and everything take on families. And uh, these coaches are on the road all the time. They're working 12, 15 hours a day year round. They don't spend a lot of time at home. It comes in a lot of wear and tear to a lot of the wives who are raising kids, uh, in some cases almost as single parents, I, I, I mean, quite honestly. I mean, they're obviously not single parents, but uh, coaches just aren't home a lot. And uh, the, you know, the, now you're asking the wives to move every couple years. You're putting the, jerking the kids from school to school. They're, they're having to remake friends all the time. It's a tumultuous life for a lot of these guys. So um, my understanding was that the family wanted to go back to Georgia, and uh, that was the impetus behind him leaving. It had nothing to do with football or preferring uh, one program or the, or the, uh, over the other or anything like that. And, um, no, the optics of it were not great, but that's what I heard on that. Will Alonzo Highsmith be part of the staff? Um, I think Alonzo is – in the process of weighing a lot of different options. If he wants to be on the staff, I think there will be a place for him at Miami. Um, initial feedback on the new strength coach, Aaron Feld, has been absolutely awesome. The kids love working with him. He's got a great personality. They're working very hard. They all talk about how sore they are all the time, but it's always with excitement. The kids love working with Aaron Feld. Uh, big basketball game against Notre Dame Wednesday night. Uh, unquestionably, why won't people rank the basketball team is the question. And I think that a lot of people that get to vote in polls are lazy. You know, I don't think they do their homework. I, I think that there's a lot of preconceived notions about things. And let's be honest, when the season started, Miami was what, like the 12th or 13th forecast? They were forecast to be the 12th or 13th best team in the ACC, and I think a lot of people remember that, and they're not looking at the body of work, which is certainly worthy of being ranked. Um, you're talking about two one-point losses to Florida State, the first of which was absolute highway robbery. Uh, you know, that should have been a split series at, 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 at worst, and Miami should be sitting there with one loss in the ACC, solidly in first place, and um, – I think people are looking and saying, oh, they've won a lot of close games. Yeah, they've also lost a couple of close games. Those things tend to even out. Uh, so they should be ranked. Now, that said, you got a big game Wednesday against Notre Dame at home. you got to win that game. And all you can do is take care of your business, keep winning, and if that happens, you will eventually get ranked when it matters, which is the end of the season. All right, 563-999-3550, 563-999-3550. Hit one on your keyboard if you if you want to come on the show. Um, let's pick this up with the three eight six. You're live on Kane Sport Live. Hey, uh, Gary. Didn't know you was on tonight, but I appreciate you taking my call. No sweat. Who's this? This is Will. Uh, What's up, Will? All right. A couple of things I want to ask you about may have been already been talked about. Like I say, I came in late, but. My first right. we'll question have to, we'll have to is, podcast uh, up real quick here tonight, so you'll be able to go back and listen if you want. All right. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was uh, who are who are the early enrollees were. Oh man, you're you're you. Let me let me try to think. I'm gonna I'm gonna go through the list, and I'm gonna tell you who I know are early enrollees. Um, if I make a mistake, please don't 
Don't hold me to it. Um, I know Cyrus oh, Moss. I understand. Is, I understand. Cy- Cyrus Moss is here. Jaleel Skinner is here. Kamari Rogers is here. Um, I don't believe Nigel Eek is here yet. Um, Wesley Besaint is here. I don't believe Isaiah Horton, Horton is here yet. Uh, Jacuri Brown is here. Uh, I don't believe Jaden Harris or Marquise Williams are here yet. If I made a mistake there, don't hold, don't uh, don't crucify me. But no, uh, no, I understand. I yeah, understand. Yeah, that's, so you that's, named that's four I, that was already there. Yeah, there's a bunch of them that are already there. Uh, a lot of the key oh, guys. Okay. Yeah. Okay, my second question is that the the defensive lineman that transferred in from USC is he a end or a tackle? He could probably play either. He could play both. Uh, I might 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 play both over the course of the season. He's the kind of guy you might put an end on first down and play him at tackle on in passing situations. You know, we got to see. You know, J- 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 Jake Lickenstein has to prove himself. Okay, um, he's got good skills. He's got a lot of ability. Uh, the scouting report I've gotten on him is he always, he doesn't always play hard enough. That's got to change here at Miami. Okay, the effort play to play can't be in question. Nobody's going to expect him to go 60 snaps. Okay, they're going to have a rotation. He's going to have a role, and when he's on the field, he's got to play 150 percent. And if he does that, I think he'll be a great pickup. Gotcha. And my final question is, I heard you uh, touching on uh, the situation about the coordinators earlier, but uh, are you hearing any names as far as the other position groups on the team, wide receiver, DB, linebacker, coach, maybe? Because um, I heard, I heard, I heard that the guy, the guy from the Dolphins, Linebacker coach may be coming over, but I haven't heard anything. I about think that ship sailed. I think he just. I think he decided to stay in the NFL, um, and I think that's why you saw Kevin Steele hired today. Um, I have heard a couple names at, at, at receiver, but I was sworn to secrecy on that. I can't say anything about that yet. Um, I've heard Frank Ponce mentioned as a possible offensive coordinator. Um, it's going to come together. It, it, it'll it'll come together in the next week or so, I think. Because uh, then there will be time to start getting ready for spring practice. All right, Gary. Appreciate you taking my call. You got it, man. Thanks for call, uh, being part of the show. All right, final call of the night. Let's go to the 304. You're live on Kane Sport Live. Yeah, I just like the idea of uh, Mario holding out. It, it kind of puts uh, the emphasis on the player. If you want to be at Miami, then come to Miami. Be done with it. And I think Shamar's from Miami. Might as well, you know, put a down payment on the house. With that NIL money, do it right. Be smart with the money. Other than that, Gary, I appreciate what we're doing, brother. Enjoy your night. All right, man. Uh, that was short and sweet. All right, guys, that's that's going to do it for tonight. I hope we gave you a little insight into what's going on on all fronts. Uh, gave you a little preview of signing day, which is tomorrow. Uh, we'll have coverage of it all, obviously, on the website. Uh, be there or be square all day long. And uh, we'll see what happens with some of these guys. Shamar Stewart in particular. So I want to thank Matt Shadell for joining us uh, for that hour earlier in the show. Thank you to everybody that called in. And until next time, have a great night, everybody.